Um, now we're going to continue also with young audiences and we have here as representing the young audiences we have here Konstantin, Emilia and Garon from the FPV Youth Jury and I'm leaving the stage to you. Thank you and welcome everyone. Uh, yeah, right, we are Emilia. Um, I'm Jaron. And I'm Konstantin. Um, yeah, and we are from the FBW Jugendfilm Jury, so the FBW, uh, FBW um, Youth Film Jury in Berlin. And this is a jury funded by the governmental Filmbewertungsstelle. Um, and it basically means uh, that they review every released movie and write a short review about it. Um, and someone came up with the question, why should we pay the adults to um, sh write a view review about a movie for children and uh, to guess how children like this movie um, or how it will influence them if you can just look for a few kids and give them pizza and a laptop and let them do it on themselves because pizza is all they want and they don't have to get paid. So, um, we have also uh, in Berlin... Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. Um, so, we have two juries um, at this time. We have a youth jury for like uh, 14 plus movies and we have a children's jury for the um, movies that are uh, like for smaller children. And um, in some way, we think this is connected to the topic of this um, leading question or the theme of this convention, because uh, we think that it's not only important to talk to the youth after the process of making a film, but also during it. And um, this is what we're talking here in this convention about. Yeah, that's really it. So uh, our part in the process of filmmaking is in the distribution. So we're there to talk about the films when they're about to be released and really give recommendations for other young adults. Um, yeah, so I think that's also an important part that uh, young adults can play, but obviously it's also important to include them during the process of creation. So we wanted to give you a short introduction, a short, like a big idea of uh, how it looks when we work together to write our film critique. Basically, uh, you can imagine us in Berlin, we're about 10 people between the ages of 14 and 16. All over Germany, there are uh, Jugend film jury, youth film jury members as young as 10 years old and as old as 18 years old. They're distributed in uh, 10 youth film juries that are distributed all over Germany. So it's really about getting the opinions not only of people from Berlin, um, but also about getting the opinions from people from smaller towns or from more rural, re rural regions in Germany. Um, so then when we finally found a, like a time when we can meet, we sit together, we screen our film and afterwards we sit down with pizza, with chocolate and with a laptop and we generally start just by talking about what we think was the topic or the general theme of the movie that we saw. And it's actually interesting because it's such a simple question but you're able to talk so much about what different people saw in the movie and from there on we talk about how we felt during our screening and we just work our way from point to point and start writing our review and after about four to five hours of work we usually have our text that's uh, written completely and afterwards we publish it on our website and on our social media channels so that uh, parents and young adults and kids can find it uh, there and yeah, if they want to know what they can see in the theaters, they can go there and check it out. Our work is guided by Eva Maria. She's here with us today as well. And she introduces us to the different strategies that can be used to like write a critique. At the beginning of our key year in the youth film jury, we had like a workshop uh, one weekend long. And we really talked about those different strategies on how to formulate your thoughts precisely and on how to write a critique. 
And uh, also during our discussions, she gives us impulses and thoughts to guide our conversation a bit, but we always take care that the thoughts and the opinions that come out of our uh, discussions are always ours, and uh, Eva Maria is just there to help us guide along the way and to cut the apples. <laughs> um, yeah, again, I think this is a concept with future because it really relies on talking to children and not talking about children and young adolescents. And it really integrates them into the industry. And I think that's really a big step that, yeah, we now started to take, but that should be, um, yeah, continued into the future. Uh, right. While preparing this talk, we asked ourselves, what was the last documentary we saw? Yeah, and this is going to go in, going to get into the direction that we already started to go in a bit during our presentation of our results from the workshops. But uh, we found out, we talked about, and we thought uh, the last documentary that all of us saw were actually not in the cinema, but on YouTube. And um, it's actually quite obvious why this is the case, because it's so much simpler to just open your laptop, click on the little YouTube icon, search for a nice little thumbnail, and there you have it. You have your own little, usually a bit more journalistic documentary that you can see. And uh, there's a lot of them on social media. Um, yeah, and it's, it's almost free, and everyone can just click on it, and it's a reality uh, like obviously we, you can't compare um, a YouTube clip uh, to a 120 minutes uh, documentary in the movie uh, a movie in the theater but it's so much easier and um, it's also like when you want to watch a movie you have to look up what movie can you watch what what do you want to watch then you have to buy a ticket then you have to go there and the, all these problems are not there if you just click on one little YouTube video at home. Um, and that's the reality, even for us who like to really, who really enjoy watching documentaries in the theater, um, or just in general movies in the theater. And um, I think it's also really hard to uh, convince your friends to go watch a movie like, for example, Sumu um, or One in a Million, um, I wouldn't even know where to start. Like, uh, I know they're to totally interested in the world, but I wouldn't even know how to convince them to go there and l see it on them, on themselves, and how to bring them, them into the theater. Um, and I think, uh, how I said, it's not comparable to watching a 20-minute video on laptop after lunch, for example. But the internet is really an awesome opportunity we need to face. Yeah, it really is. So um, we want to continue by taking a look at how we would be able to do that and what different types of documentaries, more artistic documentaries, more journalistic documentaries, can take away from the documentaries that we already see on social media. And really, again, I mean, all of us, we're a bit disturbed because our friends think of us as just like the, the movie nerds. And when we suggest something that we could see in theaters, they're like, okay, you like every weird movie, why should we see it? But uh, I think the point here, <laughs> the, the point here is really that you need to start creating a platform for young people. Um, yeah, one great opportunity uh, for that are, for example, like youth film jurors, like we have it, because they're not only an opportunity for like film producers, but also for us young people, because we really get the movie education that is needed. It's like cultural education. We just talked about it. Um, education, movie education, cinematography in schools would also be an interesting topic for that. So it's really about getting the platform and getting people yeah, just in touch with the format of documentaries. So to take a look at what we can take away from documentaries on social media, we brought with you actually uh, the beginning of two documentaries from one of my favorite journalists on YouTube. I don't know if you know him, his name is Johnny Harris. He's one of the co-founders of Vox Media in America. And uh, he does documentaries about different topics. And if I would see them on a movie poster, I would actually also think that this movie isn't going to be the most interesting that I've ever seen. Uh, one is going to be about the border crisis between India and Pakistan. And the other one is uh, about the border crisis between China and Hong Kong. 
And um, yeah, let's just take a look and uh, let's start, please. This is the Golden Temple. People come here from all over the world to bathe in its waters, to look at the holy book that is inside of this middle Golden Temple, and to just experience the holiness of this place. This place is the epicenter of Sikhism. It sits right here in northern India, in a city called Amritsar. Close by, there's another important Sikh site called Katarpur. It was established by the founder of Sikhism 500 years ago. It's the place where he spent the last years of his life, and it is the second holiest place in Sikhism. For centuries, Sikhs have been able to make pilgrimage between these two sites, to move freely throughout their heartland. But in 1947, a British lawyer drew a border here, turning what had been British India into two new countries, India and Pakistan. I can only call it the most sort of bizarre lines which were ever drawn across a map. Look at eye level. This is me in the middle of crossing one of the weirdest borders I've ever crossed. The photo is being processed. It's this one. It divides China from China. And it took me two hours to get through. This border is weird not only because it separates the same country into two, but also because it has an expiration date. July 1st, 2047. Until then, China has promised to stay out, to let Hong Kong be highly autonomous, hence the border. But the government of China doesn't really want to wait until 2047. They're ready to start erasing this border now, making Hong Kong a proper part of China. And one of the ways they're doing that is this huge bridge. Yeah, I know this isn't really the best shot, so um, here's a solution. The drone doesn't even have a microphone, but even still I couldn't help but say, take a look at this bridge as it was flying away. But seriously, take a look at this bridge. China has unveiled the world's largest sea crossing bridge. Okay, that's it. Uh, those were the two videos. And when comparing this to the traditional documentaries I'm used to see in cinemas, there are a few things that directly come to my mind. But before I tell you about those, we wanted to ask you what were the first things that came to your mind and uh, yeah, make this a bit interactive. So what were the first things that come to, came to your mind when you saw this? I really like what? Drones, yeah, yeah, drones are amazing. Look at the footage, the bridge looked awesome. Yeah, that's an interesting question. A lot of cuts, it was very fast, that's true. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So those were quite the interesting points. Yeah. Yaren's going to talk about that question a bit more later on. Um, but yeah, let me just start by telling you the things I thought about first uh, when watching or comparing those videos to the ones I'm used to see in the cinema. So. Uh, I felt like this one was way more personal. I felt like uh, the the whole format was based on somebody really telling us the story that they experienced and uh, it didn't give us the chance to like really immerse ourselves into this world, but it was more uh, yeah very open approach to tell us his story in this case. Um, yeah, and the second one was uh, he explained more. This is something that I'm not used to see in documentaries. He, or not that used to see in documentaries. He used graphics. He didn't try to, he didn't try to hide his explanatory parts, 
but uh, we really got into them and just yeah, started explaining. And then he told it in a different point. I'm sure that's because of social media. But uh, he told the, his story way faster, way more on the point, and he explained more. Um, yeah. And so the next question would be, what can cinematic documentaries aimed uh, at young people take away from this? And we think that um, internet should not be seen as a rival, but as an opportunity. And it's, for example, why don't we, for example, post a 10-minute clip on YouTube where you can introduce a character or just on TikTok, for, for example, as well, like a uh, um, 50 seconds clip where you can introduce the main character and what this whole movie is about. Maybe then the people who watch this short clip are like, wow, I want to know more about this person, about this topic, and <laughs> go into the cinema and watch the movie um, where this person, this, this, this uh, protagonist, for example, is um, taking place in. And um, yeah, maybe this is a way to um, to uh, raise the viewer, uh, the 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 the, the, the um, the awareness, the awareness, and um, the number of people who watch that movie. Yeah, I think that's yeah. Sorry. I, I get that. Like, I think um, in a trailer you see some parts of the whole movie, and um, prob probably there are some theme scenes without context. And when you probably, for example, introduce a character, you can um, say more about this per tell more about this person uh, personally. And I think there are not so many differences, but the question is also how is the trailer made and how is the film, the movie um, presented in this trailer. And I think um, many trailers for documentaries are probably not as interesting and so young people don't really think, oh, okay, I want to watch that movie because they are like, no, the trailer is already boring, why watch a movie about this topic, you know? Yeah, I think when trying to see social media as an opportunity, we need to stop thinking about social media as an opportunity to post our trailers, but uh, more to see social media as an opportunity to maybe break out short films out of your longer form documentary, because I think there are opportunities really to yeah, break out short films from longer films and uh, create different products really of your production. And uh, you could have some that are made or targeted at social media platforms. And I think every social media platform has their own format. For YouTube, you would maybe want to have like a 15-minute explanatory video. Or, um, but I, I think that's the point. I think it also works with more artistic forms. So if you don't have a documentary like the one from Johnny here, uh, then I think this can work on social media as well. You can also have more artisty documentaries. And I think there is a platform there because this is just something that is in all of us. We want to explore new worlds. And I think if we get, if we have the opportunity and if we are really able to transfer this from, not from the cinema to social media, but if we're able to bring this from the cinema to social media as well, this is a great opportunity. So uh, then the second thing, that we noticed was the different tone. It was way more direct, it was a direct speech. And uh, I know that this is something you're not really used to do in cinema. So uh, maybe you don't have to talk for yourself, you don't have to stand in front of the camera like him. But uh, I think what people really like is uh, have somebody speak to them directly. So you could ask your protagonists to talk about themselves. You could really ask the young people in front of the camera, maybe even older people in front of the camera, and ask them what you think and really ask them to tell us their story. Um, a great example of this is Tsumu that we're going to screen tomorrow. Um, but another great example of this is one of my favorite documentaries, which is called 
hour to uh, no. Dear Future Children, there's a lot of documentary news with children in it. And we brought uh, with us the first few seconds of the trailer. And I would like to ask you to screen now. Our generation fights for our seat on the table. Climate change is connected to us. I started a movement to protect my future. There is such a big divide in this country. Injustice is present in every part of our lives. A dictatorship has nothing to do with our values. I'm not from China. I'm from Hong Kong. It's up to us to shape the future. It's better for my family not to know my role on the front line. We don't risk our future by protesting on the streets. Not going on the streets will risk our future way more. Okay. And interestingly, this documentation uh, wasn't made for Netflix, but is now available on Netflix as well. Um, yeah, another point on uh, um, why people watch or don't watch documentaries, what we already said uh, before, um, is how is the story told. The storytelling is a huge part of documentaries. And I th or, or we think that um, the, the, it, it, they, the new movies should break the pattern, the traditional pattern, and um, try to be more on point and um, explain difficult to understand segments because um, if you watch a movie and something really important comes up and you just don't understand it because you don't know the word, um, then you won't know anything about this topic. It's very easy to understand. And um, we think that it's really tough um, to probably think of a new way to present things, but and, and there are also many movies who probably uh, create a great atmosphere by doing the exact opposite, but we think by doing something new, you can also um, uh, just find a new uh, audience and, and, and younger audience. And um, we think that many movies are giving away so much potential because the most interesting topic doesn't make the movie interesting, it's the storytelling that makes it interesting. And one good example for this is uh, System Error. We've also um, taken, uh, we've also brought a small piece of the trailer from that with us. And uh, we hope you can see what we mean. And yeah. If you were looking at this from the outside, you would really wonder what was going on. But what is this gross? Is it a religion that they have? Is it a god that they're chasing? Is it a virus that's taken over them? Die Natur kennt kein unendliches Wachstum. Für eine Art Wachstum scheint diese Regel allerdings außer Kraft gesetzt. You have to ask yourself, well, how much is enough to satisfy human appetites? Solange es Menschen gibt, die Bedürfnisse haben, wird es Wachstum geben. Ich halte das für ähnlich unabänderbar wie die Schwerkraft. Ich bin verantwortlich für 600 Milliarden Euro. It's the instinct of getting what I want. Six billion don't yet fly by air. The market is fantastic. I already seen the sign of that. Yeah, so uh, yeah, this is one way that documentaries can be made in a different way, obviously they don't have to, but uh, deciding for a different speed, for a different, uh, yeah, just for a different speed in storytelling can make a huge difference and can help to, yeah, create documentaries that are, no, I don't want to say less boring, but are made in, a, made in a different way. So the point that we really try to make is that options are endless and that social media can be a great tool for filmmakers all around the world and especially for documentary filmmakers to really promote their films because the reality is 
that most young people are way more familiar to social media than they are to cinema. So when filmmakers uh, see that opportunity and when they uh, yeah, really uh, make it so that young people get in touch with those documentaries on social media as well, uh, I think that can be an important part to really make them get used to that. And after a while, when they've seen a few documentaries, when their friends tell them, let's go to that doc into that documentary in the movie theaters, I think we can get way more young people into cinemas, and they're going to be ready to see a 120-minute documentary that is not cut like uh, System Arrow, but is cut way more slow and gives way more time to understand the images. But this is something that needs time and that people need to get used to it. But uh, yeah, I think social media is just a great tool to do that, and uh, yeah, we need to just try our best, and then we're going to find out what works. Okay, so my part now is to name drop a few documentaries. Um, we unfortunately can't show or won't show any clips of them because um, that would blow up our time limit. Um, but um, I'm, I'm just going to start with what generally interests us with this, what is also um, what we somewhat talked about with, um, with, with our little presentations before, but um, trying to break the pattern of the Eurocentric content being made in or for Europe audiences or European audiences is what is what is key and what is also I think very appreciated, especially with with us young people. Um, I think the documentary genre is the genre to really break um, the cultural differences and to make people culturally aware. And that's not only young people, but everyone. So if I look at the documentaries that are having a big um, release in Germany, for example, those are mostly um, European ones or US ones about European or US topics, which are important, but um, they are not the whole picture. And I think um, having the opportunity and showing topics from all around the world that have nothing to do with Europe um, is also very much um, what is needed right now. Um, I have, for example, a Taxi by Jafar Panahi, uh, which was released a few years ago. Um, as one example that um, got somewhat of a wider release in Germany and was all also very much eye-opening as to the culture of a different um, country. But um, as for what topics in general are interesting or uninteresting, I don't think you can generalize because it, it is a subjective thing. Um, but like was already said, every topic can be made interesting if the right style or the if it is in the right format, and um, I think for that, um, like has already been said, um, breaking the norm is, is also key, and um, being brave as to how documentaries are being presented. I quickly want to name a few other um, documentaries which are US, or which are American, but are also top topics that are not that European. For example, uh, Bowling for Columbine. Um, um, or boy state, but um, as to the formats, I think um, there is so, mu so much to choose from, like an essay film or just um, uncommentated footage of people and just letting the protagonist speak for themselves. I think, I'm, me personally, I'm getting a little bit tired of um, these documentaries that just flood, flood me with content or with information for like 90 to 100 minutes straight and most of the time if they're aimed for younger audiences they're also they can come off as really preachy or really talking down and oversimplifying i think another problem is that we are being underestimated a lot of times when it comes to um documentaries or films in general um and but i will, I will come to, to that also in a little bit but um having documentaries not being preachy but instead instead just showing everything and we we can figure out for ourselves what to do with it um, I think that's also what's um, really important for example um, another documentaries that are um, going in a different route when it comes to format is my Winnipeg which is basically a comedy disguised as a as a comet as a documentary um, or Lessons of Darkness by Werner Herzog or um, Beber, which was in the Berlinale, I think, competition for the um, younger audiences this year. Um, those are all films that 
don't apply to this um, documentary norm that we have laid upon um, in mainstream cinema. Um, and I think um, these differences also show when we watch at the uh, when we watch um, when we watch um, clips from YouTube videos because um, those are like already been said um, very direct and um, short documentaries in general they're not they don't need to be YouTube videos but just um, 20 to 40 minute documentaries then that are applying to cinematic norms um, are also what I personally watch more often in, in recent times because um, they even if they provide a lot of information they um, really strip down to the really important ones and they do not um, just tell the whole story or the whole picture with every little detail that maybe is not that important to understanding the key ideas because again when a documentary especially for younger people is done like this it seems a little bit frustrating because we can think for ourselves as to what the connections are um, another I have a two um, examples for these short documentaries um, one is uh, don't go telling your mama which is a uh, which is actually actually uploaded on YouTube uh, by the New York Times so you can all uh, watch it and tell me afterwards um, if you liked it as well. But it's a combination of an album and a documentary which also creates a very new feel and is therefore very in interesting but also entertaining. Or um, Black Panthers by Agnes Varda which is also like 30 minutes long and just lets the people speak for themselves and pe therefore makes the topic so much more emotionally investing than if it's 90 minutes and someone talks over footage to us um, and a little bit um, sometimes also down to us. Um, so I think what my or our inclusion uh, here is that the documentary should be made on eye level and not down at younger people. I think the label for younger audiences or for young adults is not the right way to go because then nobody will be interested, unfortunately, because we as young adults, we want to be also taken seriously as growing adults. And that's also where the, uh, where the question was uh, quite good, because even if this is not specifically made for young adults, we can comprehend it and we um, also are interested in it. So um, labeling a documentary for young adults is not the right way to go because also adults then will not watch it because they also have the standard of watching content appropriate for their age. Um, and, and as to how prim to promote it, which is um, my last point here, um, it's also very important to make the promotion um, on eye level and not, for example, just go with um, what may seem like uh, a trend on TikTok or Instagram or whatever, because if, if it's just done to to um, grab the younger people because it's what may seem like it's in, it often also feels sorry, um, it often also feels like it's um, very much cut towards us and not to everyone. Uh, we don't need special treatment. We just want to be treated like you all equally, um, and. Yeah, I guess one documentary I can name for that is Moon Age Daydream, which I um, had the feeling that was quite um, popular in my age group in Berlin. Um, but that's also a, a documentary that isn't applying to the cinematic norms and also not the, we are not the target audience and we are not targeted in the marketing. So um, yeah, maybe that's uh, one example we could um, as an industry look more on. I think that was that was everything. Are we in time? Okay. Yeah. Then Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs>